Good afternoon and welcome everyone to the most recent installment of the 2CC webinar series. Um, today we have Dr. Audrey Van Duen. He's a professor of mechanical engineering and chemical engineering. He's also the director of the Materials Computation Center. So without anything more, Audrey, please go ahead. Thank you very much, Kevin, for the introduction. Um, so I'll talk about essentially uh, the reactor first sort method, which has been a method that, my, that I personally have been working on for the last 20 years and that my group has been extensively working on in various directions. I'll introduce my various group members in a second. In particular, I'm going to talk about how we've been using that over the last couple of years to look at automatic layer deposition, chemical vapor deposition in complex 2D materials, and clearly I've defined what 2D materials I'm uh, discussing with. Let me first introduce the members of my group that have been participating in this work. Um, so a lot of work, let's see. So this is my group. The picture is a bit outdated, but uh, the, 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 the names are, uh, are up to date. So we clearly are due a new, uh, a new, a new group picture. Um, let's see. So the main players here are, uh, so a significant amount of uh, work from Dr. Weizan, uh, who is essentially done, essentially the, the boron nitride work I'm presenting. I'll show some of uh, Dr. Dunda Yuma's work, where he is, he's responsible for the potato stem work that you'll see up here. And he collaborated with uh, Charlie Ashraf, who was a doctor since the last uh, four weeks or so. And let's see, yeah, that's, uh, those, those are the main, uh, that's, we are essentially, uh, as you see here, there's a, very, a wide range of topics there, there's, but there's a central sort of method theme, uh, a method theme in my group that essentially is, uh, is reactive force fields. And so, uh, so I'll give you a relatively brief introduction about the new reactive force fields. And so I'll, I'll focus on two types of 2D materials. I hit some highlights of our Maxine work, which is a 2D titanium carbide, or metal carbide material that I work with in our EFRC uh, projects with, uh, with Oak Ridge. And then I'll uh, show a bit more detail of our, our, of our molecular disulfide growth. Um, so ReactiveF is a reactive force field, so it allows us to do atomistic scale simulations on relatively complex materials and the interfaces. The idea is that it is significantly faster than our initial based tools, so we can do the, the simulation that you saw play. This is a, uh, a, a sort of a char combustion, so we have all these polyaromatic hydrocarbons that are kind of getting oxidized. This was essentially a one, one process of simulation that ran for about two days or so. And if you look for the initial equivalent under that, that would probably be a very significant amount of process of running for a couple of months. So this allows us to scale up from up initial and essentially still retain a lot of the chemical um, uh, 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 details. Let me see. Yeah. This is, for example, an interesting simulation. This is a nano indentation case where we have a diamond nano tip going into a nickel metal. Uh, this is a bare nickel, so on the way out it grabs a couple of nickel atoms. And we can, for example, study how oxidation changes the nano indentation behavior. If I clearly oxidize my nickel, it turns into nickel oxide, it becomes chemically far more inert. And then my nano tip will actually uh, end up not dragging out any, uh, any of the nickel atoms. Um, well, uh, so I'm, I've been the director of MCC, the Material Computation Center at Penn State, for roughly three years now. Uh, so MCC essentially is a, uh, is a collaborative, uh, collaborative between various faculty at Penn State interested in simulations at, uh, at a wide range of scale. And what we're trying to do is, so the, the role of especially atomistic scale, uh, scale simulation for a long time has been, so experimentalists see something interesting, they call their favorite atomistic scale person and tell them I see something interesting, can you kind of explain it to me? And then um, the simulations go, and if things go well, uh, whatever was observed can be explained. And everybody's happy, you write a paper, and they're kind of good to go. So that's clearly, there's a lot of uh, value in that particular collaboration. Arguably, however, you may want to turn the table on this. Uh, one, one thing that simulation has in favor of experiments is it is relatively inexpensive. Uh, although computers don't come completely for free, they are still uh, significantly cheaper than the experimental equivalent. Probably more important is, it is really easy for a transferable simulation tool to, to rapidly investigate very, very new concepts. I mean, if you do a, have a CVD chain, then I call you up and say, hey, you've been playing around with molybdenum all the time, try doing something with this much for a change. Then uh, it will probably take you a couple of months to even make a change towards a sort of new game, because for a, for a computation game, it's just a matter of clicking the bismuth atom, putting it in the simulation, picking clearly the right trigger potentials or force source, so that will take a little while. But beyond that, your preparation time is very, very short. And so it's a great environment to test out very, very new ideas, see whether they're viable, and see whether they're worth investing your sort of experimental time in to say, 
where, uh, where, the web, uh, where the summary will, co will come out. So I'll show you some examples where I think that theory can lead the way in these matters. Um, so, uh, Mathilde, one, one thing as well, if you're interested in any of the theory tools presented here, a nice in, uh, information exchange is the Material Computation Center website. Uh, we have this form that people can fill in, they can tell okay, what sort of simulations they want to do, what method they want to interact with. So this has been pretty uh, popular since its uh, installment uh, in 2015. We have responded to over a thousand requests on this particular website, primarily for sale distribution and linking people with the right type of, type of DFT tools. Okay, so uh, my, my group is working in, in, in reactive force field, so it's good to sort of say where that sits in sort of the time space domain in the uh, in, uh, uh, in, in material computation. So we are typically find ourselves, oops, I'm sorry, in between the up initial people. Uh, so quantum mechanics, very accurate, very, very transferable, uh, but very computation expensive. So that means that you know, thousand atoms is pretty much is a, is, a, is, a, is a very large system for uh, uh, people working quantum mechanics. Also, the time axis, if you want to do dynamics with opposition methods, you're probably looking at, at most a couple of picoseconds of time. So one step off from that, traditionally are the empirical force fields, so they can go significantly larger. So we now try abandon our, uh, our uh, attempts at solving the Schrodinger equation and just go to a completely new and more empirical set of equations, which are mathematically far more easier to solve but are not typically as transferable as the sort of the uh, artificial based methods. And one thing that one typically gives us when we go from quantum mechanics to empirical force field is reactivity. Traditional reactive force fields, this is a kind of a broad uh, thing, to, uh, general thing to say, but especially with first elements, traditional empirical force fields work well with physical interaction with molecules, but they don't have the means to do any chemistry. So this is where reactive force fields have been sitting. I'll show you a little bit about the history of that particular concept. We essentially, uh, these force fields tend to be completely more expensive than the non-reactive force fields, but they are significantly faster, maybe by factor nine or so in quantum mechanics, so we can do uh, large systems, we can go to a more methods if necessary, and again to larger time timescale, the nanosecond, maybe if you push it into the microsecond domain, uh, to look at essentially complex chemical uh, interactions. So VXFF is essentially a bond order based potential. Uh, so the concept is that to break and make bonds, and uh, let me make sure, yeah, okay, uh, here's, uh, let me use, uh, so this is essentially, uh, for lack of a better term, a central equation in VXFF. So every iteration we put in our bond distances are ij, and we turn them into bond orders. And as you see, this is a nice continuous relationship, and so I can actually calculate forces, and I can make an image based on this. So this goes back to a pretty, uh, a straightforward chemical concept. We all know about single, double, and uh, triple bonds. We all uh, understand that the triple bond has a shorter bond distance than a single bond. So all we essentially do here is just put a continuous relationship in the, between the bond distance and bond order relationship, uh, so that we can actually do this on a continuous sta uh, state. So now that means in the active force field, we also have a bond order 1.5, a bond order 1.2, and a bond order 0.2. So subsequently, uh, we update these bond orders of iteration, and then we like to use things like angular and dihedral terms. These are, these are uh, three or four body terms that have worked very well in empirical non-reactive force fields. What we simply do is we put that bond order, that's a nice sort of smooth function going from, you know, for carbon from three to zero. We just put it in front of them. That means that all our angle terms also become nice and smooth. So if the bond breaks, it's angle terms and dihedral terms go with it. The big decision point in the active force field is what do we do with the non bonded interactions? I'm sorry. Uh, oops. What do we do with the non bonded interactions? Uh, do we switch them off? That's a choice to make, uh, one can make, or do we keep them? In the we made a choice to keep them, and I'd argue that for the Columbian interaction, it turned out to be a very good choice because that means that we get a lot of material transferability. Since we calculate an unbond Columbian interaction, we can essentially make a transition from covalent materials, which are reasonably well described by the bond order concept, to ionic materials, which are well described by clearly chlorine interaction. Now, given that all materials, maybe bar some exceptions like, like graphite and maybe N2, are pretty much a mixture between covalent, uh, between, uh, covalent materials and ionic materials, that gives you a lot of transferability, because I don't have to tell you actually that this is a fully ionic material, then the, the force with itself doing the training can figure out how much of the bond is covalent and how much is ionic in character. 
So I won't say too much about this, but uh, the charges that we have to have are calculated by the method itself, so the user doesn't provide them, and they are geometry dependent. So when essentially the configuration changes, the charges will also change. This is essentially is updated every step. It's pretty expensive. This is really the, uh, the step that computationally uh, costs you the most time. But it also can do polarization, and so that gives you a lot of potential to you know, put electric fields and all that on your systems. I won't show today. So you've seen this equation already. Now, every first field has its speciality. Uh, uh, that doesn't mean that it can exclusively be used for that speciality, but that's really where it was founded from. So we at RF, our target was try to do chemistry with reasonable barriers. And that sort of separates we at RF from the sort of the first generation Bloomberg retentions. May some of you may have gone to John Banner's presentation uh, last week. He was on campus. He's pretty much the founder of, of the reactive force field uh, concept. And uh, his banner potential in 1990 is, is, is still used quite extensively. And it can make and break bonds. One thing it's not so great for is barriers, because they use a much, much sharper bond order cutoff. And so they, they are not, it's not very good at bond order conserving reactions. This is a very important reaction for any of the any biology enzyme based reaction. This is a self reaction, so I have four one molecules. They essentially transfer four proteins at the same time and go back to four one molecules. So clearly, energetically, nothing changes. But the barrier is astonishingly low. I mean, the OH bond is a very strong bond. It's the sec second strongest single bond on the periodic table, and the HF bond is stronger. Uh, I break four of them, so that's worth 500 keiko, or if you want to uh, talk in joules, it's about 2,000 kilojoules. I break that, I do this entire reaction with 20 keiko barrier. That's pretty impressive. I mean, that's, that's you know, less than 5% of the actual uh, the bond strength. And so this is why enzymes are so effective. A lot of things that enzymes do is tease water molecules in the right configuration so that they can do these type of bond order conserving reactions to break strong bonds. Like a peptide bond is significantly stronger than 20 keiko, but still an enzyme can break that bond and make a new bond at a very, very low computational expense. So this also plays a big role in, oops, uh, here it is. this is a reaction quite important for low temperature combustion. This is a small biomolecule that in a single step reaction, gets converted to formaldehyde, water, and even smaller, uh, well, uh, ethylene hydroxide. And the barrier for this is 69 keiko. Uh, the quantum barrier is roughly 65 keiko, so that uh, reads reasonably well. Uh, this is weaker than any of the single bonds in the molecule. So the reason why it's weaker is that uh, you break bonds, but at the same time you make new bonds. So the price that you pay for the chemical conversion is less than the price of any single bond in the molecule. Reactive F is essentially a molecular dynamic force field, which means it con can conserve energy provided you take a small amount of time step. So everything is continuous. Um, one thing that's uh, very useful about the method is that the user doesn't have to say where the reactions happen. There are reactive force field concepts that only work by the grace of the user saying iteration 20,000, this bond is going to break, and that may have uses. But clearly, this, is, this allows you to be far more intuitive. The user provides the in, in initial structure, sets the condition, temperature, and pressure, and provided the force field is well trained, and that clearly is a big provision, it should essentially be able to give you accurate chemistry. And one thing that's very nice for the user is the fact that each element only has one atom type. So that means there's only one carbon in the XFF, whether it's a methane, carbon dioxide, or non carbide, it's the same atom type. So you can very easily use transitions between materials and interfaces. This is pretty horrible for the developer, but since my group are only <coughs> developing these things, that's our problem and not the problem of the user. Uh, so why we do this? Uh, Reactive, I won't claim it's as accurate as Apinicio. We try to get as close to Apinicio as we can, but clearly Apinicio is more transferable, and the Schrodinger equation, uh, or however you solve it, is a better basis for essentially calculating material properties than any empirical function is. But it is significantly faster. And so we can do much larger time scales, we can do much larger systems. And for many materials, size is important. Because if you go too small, there's a lot of effects that essentially you cannot capture properly. Uh, it is much slower than non reactive force field. As I already mentioned, the functional form is significantly more complex, and especially the charge calculation is pretty expensive. The scale is almost linear, uh, while most of the quantum methods are scaling uh, best of n to the power of 3. So if uh, two atoms take you an hour, and four atoms will take you, uh, no, sorry, if two atoms will take you two hours, then four atoms will take you eight hours in quantum. And uh, in empirical force field, it will essentially have almost a linear relationship. Um, and one thing that's, been, that's quite attractive about Reactive F since we made a lot of transferability choices during its development, like, for example, the only one Coulomb interaction. Uh, we started in 2001 
with hydrocarbons, and we managed to drag the concept across the periodic table. So all these first worlds essentially use the same functional form. But it's pretty unique in the first world domain. There are, for example, very good hydrocarbon force fields around, and there are very good nitrogen chloride force fields around, but these things typically don't communicate very well with each other because they have a very different functional basis. So then the user will have to figure out how to do that communication. The XFF, there's no issue there. A sodium chloride uses the same functional form as the, uh, as the, as the methane. So apart from being quite popular as a reactive force field, it also had a lot of popularity as simply a, a, a force field to simulate interfaces between materials. Uh, so we've been pretty active in distributing this. Uh, one of the main distribution sources is LAMPS. LAMPS is an open source code that is released by uh, Sandia National Labs. Uh, that, uh, got, uh, it contains far more than just VXFF, but uh, VXFF incorporated. Uh, my group uh, uh, primarily now uses the ADF band graphical user interface. This is developed by SCM Amsterdam. This is a commercial code, but the academic licensing are uh, uh, relatively generous. And right now it is pretty much both codes provide pretty good parallel scaling, so you can essentially run them in multiple processes and get a good efficiency out of that. So I'll go over the slide relatively quickly to keep more time for the two dinner together, but just give you a sort of a feel of transferability here. These are just some areas that we hit over the years with VXFF. So uh, my main affiliation is mechanical engineering, although my PhD is in chemistry. And the reason why I managed to reason myself into the mechanical engineering department is that I claimed I understood combustion, and mechanical engineers do like combustion. And so this was one of the areas that my group is still active in. So this is typically how the uh, type or how these projects might look. So we first train VXFF primarily, although not necessarily exclusively, against up initial data. So this is just one example. There's a lot more data in our training set, but we take a small molecule and we open closed angle. This is a oxygen carbon oxygen angle. And so that gives us nice data to train the, the force constants in the force field. Then we take a relatively small system, which is roughly a thousand atoms or so, and therefore which we think that we have appropriate uh, experimental data. This is JP10. Uh, this is our jet fuel. It's a very highly strained hydrocarbon, and that means that upon uh, combustion, you actually get all that strain energy kind of for free. So it essentially creates a lot of heat, which is good for high flying aircraft. It is hugely expensive because it has to be all synthesized, which is clearly an uh, expensive step to do. Um, so what we did, what we look at is pyrolysis, so pretty much dissociation is molecule as a function of temperature. At the VX level, we, uh, we have to run it as roughly 2000 Kelvin because we only have a couple of nanoseconds of time. But we can do a bunch of temperatures, and then we can compare that with experimental pyrolysis. This is roughly 1000 Kelvin, and we see we're pretty much on the same line. So we get our linear parameters from that, uh, including activation energy, and we see that we are here within half a keiko, which is a pretty nice level of agreement. Arguably better than we deserve because the DFT methods that we use to train against, typically the error bar is bigger than half a KCO. But, uh, we, the, but the more important one, we are, these forces work very well with different uh, hydrocarbon classes. So we want to do alkanes, alkenes, aromatics. We actually can pretty good activation and use across the board. And then uh, Lin Kun Shin uh, here in the audience uh, expanded this towards probably our most complex catalysis systems to date. Uh, if you have a cold drive fuel, there typically is a lot of pyrites in there, and that's, that's, uh, that's, uh, if you want to use that fuel in contact with the catalyst, that's typically a pretty bad idea, because the pyrite deposits itself on your on the catalyst, and the catalytic properties change. The catalyst essentially ages very quickly. So we essentially did a simulation. We had this, this, uh, the yellow stuff, a bit hard to see, is, uh, is pyrite. The red uh, clusters are, is a chromium oxide, a relatively common uh, oxidation catalyst. We have butane in there, and we can read and see how over time the catalytic function changes. It still remains catalytic, but it changes essentially from an oxidation catalyst into a hydrogen exchange catalyst because that's pretty much what pyrite is quite good for. Uh, for materials, this is how we typically train our force fields. So these are equations of state, these are volume energy relationships for different crystal modalities. This is titania, so we have a rutile, anatase, and brookite. Um, then this was a nice side by side up initial. Uh, we had the first field study, uh, Jorge Sofo in physics here was part of this work. So we did a side-by-side -side study of water on a small titanium oxide slab, this is a retail surface, and we, we simply measured the water dissociation kinetics. And so we found indeed that after training, the first field reproduced up initial kinetics quite well. And then at the first field level, we can increase it. So this was work done with Christian Fichthorn, where we look at titanium nanoparticles. They initially are pure oxides, 
Now, if you just put an oxide in vacuum, the growth is pretty random. They hit each other, they stick, and they never come off. But if you put them in supercritical water, actually the water creates a hydroxyl coating, and that means that these particles can slide across each other and find a good hydrogen bond uh, alignment, and then they can essentially reverse the reaction and pretty much sinter. So then you get very nice sort of alignment growth, and so the role of water in that is pretty essential. Um, one area that we're working on extensively is mechanical chemistry. So this is a small uh, silica uh, uh, nano, well, it's actually not a nanoware, it's essentially a fragment. So it's high strain on this side and low strain on the basal plane. If you put it in supercritical water, it essentially hydrolyzes the high strain area and the low strain area is non-reactive. Um, and that can then be applied. This is a 650,000 uh, uh, atom lamp simulation where we look at water diffusion for a clay silica interface and see how uh, the various diffusion conditions there, including reactive diffusion. Uh, high energy materials are all the popular area for these type of materials because clearly the reaction kinetics is so fast that uh, it's hard, hard to uh, model, uh, monitor experimentally. So we did a chemistry. This is RDX uh, of uh, a, a, a very insensitive explosive uh, where we check the gamma, uh, various gamma, chemistry channels. We also check some of the physics. This is essentially a sort of shock velocity in the material. So very important for initiation and uh, other properties. And this is a large-scale simulation on my group, this is a group from the University of Southern California. This is roughly two or three million atoms, and they essentially add a void in the high-energy crystal. Uh, this is essentially temperature. You see, when the molecules hit a void, they move so quickly that they essentially, these molecules all, when they go over the barrier, they have a huge exothermic energy release. So they, their speed gets to be so high, they can essentially cross that initiation barrier and essentially initiate. And so this, this linked very well with experimental observables that if you don't get good, good crystallinity in your high energy materials, the sensitivity uh, becomes much, much higher. And that's a problem because the material might go off before you want it to go off. We do a significant amount of battery work. I won't talk too much about that. One thing that uh, also links back to mechanical chemistry. So this is a carbon nanotube. Uh, we see that typically as an inert material. We have here some lithium stuff. If I put strain in the material, the lithiums can eat right through my carbon nanotube. And this is clearly a big deal for a carbon anode because the carbon anodes go to very significant expansion and compression, so significant strain. So it's quite likely that these carbon anodes do have very significant uh, chemical modifications during charge and discharge. So this will be what I talk about for uh, later on. So we've been, uh, over the last couple of years, we started work on lipid disulfides. Uh, and also I'll talk, uh, just hit some highlights of it, but the other 2D materials that we extensively are working on are vaccines. These are, if you talk to certain people at Drexel, they like to make you think that these are the best 2D material ever. And people in this room might disagree with that, but uh, still, uh, I'll show you at least their arguments in a second. Uh, these are titanium carbides that can essentially get surface functionalized. And so one area we worked on the water uh, diffusion inside these areas. And also I'll show you some of the chemical aspects. One area that is first also quite good at is extreme chemistry. So this is actually a silica nanoparticle hitting a graphene at about 10 kilometers a second. And we can actually see how we see a mechanical shock wave. We also can see how the energy, uh, the chemistry initiates. They first the red crack, and then when the energy sort of uh, gets a little bit uh, uh, lower, a little bit, we actually see that the crack propagates along the crystallographic domains. But these type of extreme chemistry are, are, are a pretty good target for these type of force fields. And one area I'll also mention, uh, so I talked about a nanosecond, and a nanosecond is a pretty hard limit for us when we do regular molecular moves. Every time step is smaller than a femtosecond, so 10 to the power minus 15 seconds. For uh, So a, a nanosecond is a million steps. So 10 nanoseconds is 10 million steps, so if each step takes half a second, that's, that, that's a significant amount of time. And time is pretty tough to parallelize. Uh, now what you can do, however, is abandon at least partially your molecular dynamics concept and integrate a little bit of Monte Carlo in, step, uh, in there. Uh, we found out this was a uh, work done by Eric Knight's group in Antwerp. He's been spearheading this. Uh, um, so with molecular dynamics, if I do, for example, graphene growth, I can maybe, if I'm lucky, I can get to stage E, where I have a little bit of a carbon cap and all that, but clearly I don't see anything that looks like a carbon nanotube yet. With force bias Monte Carlo, I can get all the way to here. So this is one, one disadvantage for a Monte Carlo is you essentially lose t uh, track of time. In molecular dynamics, time is a pretty rigid thing, you know what it is. Monte Carlo, since you have a Monte Carlo step in there, it's always hard to say how much time that step would actually have taken. 
but arguably this is a microsecond, millisecond type sort of structure. And one thing that's unique about it is it actually has a really good crystallinity. If I use pure Monte Carlo, I typically get a much, much more random structure with many, many more essentially defects. So by taking my Monte Carlo step in the direction of the forces indicated by molecular dynamics, I can kind of get the best of both worlds. And we do some neat things. We can do, for example, electric field mitigated growth, and we can do things like cold bombardment. This was a nice piece of work where uh, theory kind of led the way of experiment. We indicated, hey, if you carbon bombard with argon by growing the breath, you may be able to destroy the five moment rings and keep most of the six moment rings intact because the five moment rings are a little bit less stable. So using theory tools to figure out what would be the right kinetic energy for the argon, then we managed to bribe an experimentalist to actually do this. So that's the Ostrikov group. And so this got published in 2013, where essentially the theory kind of indicated the type of conditions that experimentalists should look at. So I'll show hopefully some more examples of that later down. So uh, Maxine's have been area of my group for the last few years. These are funded um, so we're part of an EFRC program led by uh, Oak Ridge. Uh, and so the Gogotsi group at uh, uh, Drexel is part of that team. And so they clearly have been leading the Maxine uh, area. So the idea is that this is a pretty versatile type sort of synthesis concept. Uh, we have an early transition metal. We have essentially a group 1340 metal, something that can easily essentially react with fluoron or other etchant agencies. And we have carbon and nitrogen. So this is my, my initial crystal structure. I can essentially etch out my A layer. So the aluminum has not, not high affinity to fluoride and titanium. So you can with some selectivity, not 100% selectivity, but some selectivity, you can etch out the aluminum. And you get these type of 2D type sort of layers. And indeed, you see, if you, uh, they essentially indeed uh, look very clay-like. And indeed, morphology wise, they pretty much are like a clay. They're essentially a metal oxide, uh, just like an aluminum silicate, that likes to organize itself in 2D layers. One thing that's, however, where it differentiates itself from clays is that they have a very high electroconductivity. Less attractive, because in clays, aluminum silicates are pretty much insulators, or at least they're bad semiconductors. These have a high electroconductivity, and since you have a wide range of synthesis, so this can work with any transition metal within these constraints. You can essentially bulk them pretty easily, and so you can do interesting electrocatalysis where you can be bulked in there, different types of uh, electric potentials, and essentially drive the chemistry. So that's one of the attractive of these type of materials. Um, so we've been working, uh, this was a paper that came out this year. Uh, so uh, the experimentalist was Chi Han Sang and Ray Unisic at, uh, at Oak Ridge. We did a reactor, reactor force field group, so Doomberg in the audience was uh, the part of these simulations. And then we connected with DFT data from Paul Kent's uh, group and his co-workers. Uh, so the idea was the experiment we saw this sort of, they called it, we, we had a press release, and uh, I only got it from the press release, so that's not a word that was used anywhere in the publication, but it sounds nice. So they call it a cannibalistic material. The idea is that we make a defect, the defect grows and grows and grows, but all the material come out of the defect get used further down to essentially grow essentially an extra layer of titanium carbide. So that's very different clearly than, let's say, graphene, where we would never see a sort of a separate carbon structure because of the chemistry of, of graphene. We use titanium carbide simply grow an extra layer, and so we can essentially link the, the migration and the crystallization based on, uh, on the defect growth. Um, so one area that we've been working on, this is actually was quite a pretty interesting project. We are involved with lasted for exactly four weeks. Uh, so there was an intro, uh, vaccines are potentially interesting catalysts, especially because they also have an electrocatalytic uh, concept, but we found using ReXLF, so we essentially merged a vaccine description with a protein force field, which was a pretty easy merge because uh, uh, that took uh, essentially about 10 minutes or so. We found that these seem to be unusually active to ask uh, uh, essentially uh, hydrolysis-based chemistry. So you essentially can link your area on a vaccine site, since the maxine has both oxygen functionalities and uh, protons, you can essentially then push the proton across the molecule and dissociate the maxine. So what we found here, that so if we, uh, this is a typical VX style simulation, we go to crazy high temperatures, but this is just to sort of uh, investigate the chemistry space. So we just take urea by itself, it doesn't actually react very quickly. So we see that I start with 70 molecules, uh, 2700 Kelvin, 50 of them will survive. Now, Experimentally, to say this is not correct, uh, we really doesn't survive at 2700 Kelvin, that is correct, but on a nanosecond scale, a lot of them will survive on a this time scale. If I mix them with water, so this is hydrolysis chemistry, so clearly water can accelerate the chemistry, uh, but if I mix them with maxine, uh, then 
my goodness, you get far, far more accelerated. And so we see indeed that the effective barrier for this conversion is only 20 kK. So that turns it into almost a room temperature event. So these are the type of simulation boxes we use. And so here's some more uh, data for that. But we essentially then demonstrated that uh, these vaccines can work as catalysts for these type of conversions. So that actually linked very well with a set of experimental data the Oak Ridge people already had in hand. So we added that to the manuscript, and that eventually, after lots of going back and forth, it still passed the, the Jax uh, uh, people. And so that got published probably about uh, a month ago or so. Uh, otherwise, the vaccines have got lots of 2D material, they're actually fundamentally unstable. So over time, if you keep your vaccine, uh, you expose it to the outside air, uh, it essentially you get a nice sort of shiny 2D material. If you leave it too long, it turns essentially into rutal and graphene. Because fundamentally, rutile and graphene are more stable than vaccine. And so we wanted to see how the environmental effects, so first we wanted to see if we could simulate the conversions, that actually worked pretty well. We took our unmodified vaccine force field and just simply exposed it to water. And we also exposed it to things like peroxide and uh, oxygen water uh, mixtures. And we need to see that we can grow a, well, a titanium dioxide uh, type material. Now, this was done with pure molecular dynamics, not with the C, so we couldn't really get any crystallinity on a time scale. But we could essentially see uh, in experiments, then we see various signatures of rutile and anatase coming out of these structures. So, this is quite important for long term. Applications of vaccine, how do you keep these materials stable? So when you apply them, that they actually don't revert back to their more fundamentally stable uh, 3D counterparts. Um, yeah. So turning to molybdenum disulfide or calcotinoate in particular. So uh, let's see, about a year ago, in collaboration with Vin Crespi and Yuan Chi Wang, uh, we developed a quite accurate description of molybdenum disulfide. So this had a pretty interesting training set. So um, this essentially is a comparison between the DFT data here on Qi and the XLF. Well, my goal did, uh, my filming here come in uh, as a collaboration with Sulin Zeng, where we looked essentially at the effects of essentially curvature on the chemistry of these type of materials. And so this is kind of interesting. So the blue curve is the simple pristine molybdenum disulfide. And as you might express, uh, expect, if I compress the material, it goes up in energy. If it gets a curvature, it likes to be flat, so I have to put energy in the thing. But this gets to be much more complex if we put vacancies in there. So if I put, for example, a two vacancy case, we actually see that the material likes to compress because the vacancies are essentially sort of uh, force and curvature in there. And what's kind of interesting from a chemistry perspective, you see also that the gap between the vacancy structure and the pristine structure initially that's pretty huge. So taking two vacancies, shorter vacancies, uh, requires a lot of energy uh, without essentially compression. But uh, if you manage to put a curvature in there, that energy difference goes down to about 10 kK. So at this stage, if I can get 40% compression, only 10 kK will allow me to make defects in molybdenum um, disulfide. One of the things that we did, we turned it against a wide range of vacancies. I don't show it here, but also it works very well for the vacancy migration. So you can actually do vacancy reconstruction patterns and all these type of things. Uh, ah, I'm sorry, I didn't update the slide. So this paper actually came out. This is a 2017 paper. I'm sorry about that. Um, so, Charlie Asraf, also in his audience, uh, collaborated with a former PhD student from my group, who is now at USC, working in the Magix 2D consortium. Uh, he expanded this. We wanted to actually do molybdenum disulfide silver interfaces. So, we did some expansion to our silver interactions with graphene, uh, because we figured we don't really need the molybdenum graphene interaction at this stage, at least, because uh, the molybdenum is relatively far away from the graphene area. Uh, so, silver doesn't really bind very well to pristine graphene, so 20 kK is still no, it's worth something, it's a silver atom, but we get much, 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 well, all these numbers are pretty low, these are essentially sort of physics option. Um, what gets more, uh, you can also do SAH, that also works pretty well, but what gets interesting here is these numbers. So you see here, and this is a particularly interesting one, this is 178 kK per mole. This is a silver binding to a graphene defect. So I just take out a single carbon, clearly the single carbon is not chemically stable, but what's interesting here, this number is higher than the carbon equivalent. So silver binds better to graphene than carbon itself. The carbon binding energy is roughly 178 kK. Uh, so, uh, so that prompted us the idea that maybe, maybe we can use the graphene defects to selectively pick out silver atoms from essentially uh, a molybdenum disulfide. Uh, so we first checked out, can we actually deposit silver in there, and that, that, that worked pretty well. So we put some defects, we can grow a pretty nice silver cluster, so that, that, that part worked pretty decently. 
Um, oh, sorry, there's a slight interlude here before I continue with this. Um, so uh, I will show some fourth bias Monte Carlo in a second. So this is just to highlight the difference between fourth bias Monte Carlo and regular MD. Once again, this is for modern by so far. With MD, this is the best we can do. With fourth bias Monte Carlo, we can cover much, much longer time scales and actually can make sort of nice uh, crystalline types of hidden morphologies. And so with fourth bias Monte Carlo, we can uh, now look at uh, crystal growth. So this is a movie up that some of you may have seen before. Ah, oh, it's actually the movie on this slide. But uh, the reason why I'm showing this, I'm going to show you the bone nitride equivalent in that. And this was a simulation we did about two years ago. Uh, a guy a lot of did in my group. Um, and we can actually see how we can use false bias Monte Carlo to essentially expand the size of a molybdenum disulfide cluster. One thing I want to draw attention to in this case, this is a pristine graphene is that there's no orientation or orientation bias in our simulation. You see that the molybdenum disulfide under all conditions of these can slide very easily over the surface and sort of reorganize, reorient that itself. So if I use this at the growth medium, I probably don't see any orientation bias in my molybdenum disulfide structure. So now, having shown that graphene and molybdenum disulfide, we now wanted to see if we could, for example, use graphene with diff defects to imprint a certain defect structure in molybdenum disulfide. So this is clearly, this has no experimental equivalent right now. This is a nice area for theory to exploit, see whether this is all feasible. So what we have here is a graphene sheet. You won't, don't see it right now, but there's a couple of defects in there that will become more apparent when we start playing the movie. This is a pristine molybdenum disulfide. And so this was worked by, uh, by Bruno Wilmas, which came out just about two weeks ago. Um, so what we do is we press it on, we keep it there for a little while, we heat it up about 700 Kelvin, if I remember correctly, and then we pull it out. You see now the defects are a little bit clearer from this angle. And what we can essentially do here is pull out very selectively silver atoms. See that all we pull out, this is not a 100% success rate, but uh, a number of these graphene vacancies managed to pull out the silver. So the real science behind this was that also, and you can look at it in the paper, we did not only with single vacancies, which are phenomenally probably not the most realistic vacancies, we also tried this for dive vacancies and other type of uh, typical vacancies, like sort of 585 types of the rings. It turns out that dive vacancies work pretty well, but you need need a vacancy, just a sort of a distorted ring structure, like a 57, it doesn't have enough binding power to pull out the silver. And the next step can then be, if you, for example, have made your molybdenum disulfide, you may want to sort of link it up with something organic. So, for example, if you want to make a sensor out of this, you can essentially get these uh, silver defects to react with an organic. In this case, we have a epoxide. And you can see later in the movie that the epoxide finds one of our defects. Uh, I have to kind of guess which epoxide it is, but it will become apparent a little bit later down this. Oh, yeah, here's one. Uh, pretty much the epoxide opens, and uh, now you can have your... Uh, hydrocarbon chemistry, so you can pretty much link any type of large organic linker to this. So clearly, I don't claim that this is a simple experiment to do, but we can essentially test out conditions and see whether this is worth pursuing at an experimental level. Okay, so coming to my last item here, uh, so we saw our work on the graphene, and the main thing was there was no orientational bias in the molybdenum disulfide growth, and that can be a disadvantage because it will clearly be attractive if all these molybdenum disulfide triangles grow essentially in the same direction. So it turned out, this was some experimental work, indicating that HPM might essentially give you a much, much higher amount of orientation. So we see essentially, this is that uh, this, these are experimental images, that we got now 90% uh, 90 of the flakes growing in the same orientation. So the question is, why is that? And so this was some work by Yuan Chi Wang. He essentially did an extensive DFT studies, figuring out what defects are stable in the nitride and how the uh, molybdenum disulfide might be able to interact with that. And he found out that this is pretty much the most stable configuration. We essentially have a missing uh, boron atom uh, on the uh, boron nitride, and we essentially have a molybdenum at atom. And their binding energy is very, very substantial. So that, if you look at sort of defect defect pair, this is probably the best defect defect pair in place of molybdenum disulfide boron nitride systems. Now, conveniently, uh, they actually match pretty well. So it actually did this, this situation where I have my molybdenum at atom binding into that boron nitride defect. It actually, uh, uh, from a strain perspective, actually a pretty nice combination. The, uh, the crystal parameters are relatively close to uh, well, boron nitride, relatively close to molybdenum disulfide. So actually you can grow these things with a lower amount of added strain. 
And what has to be interesting then, though, is, so that that's, that doesn't distinguish that from graphene in many ways, but this is really what boron nitride has to offer. Boron nitride, since you're boron nitrogen, has essentially a dipole. So there's charge transfer between the boron and nitrogen. That means if I rotate my molybdenum disulfide, it essentially goes up with energy very significantly, half an EV. Now, if you do the same thing in graphene, it's not completely identical, because uh, the rotation is, uh, you still have a slightly different environment in the graphene, but it's uh, only about a factor 5 or maybe a factor 10 lower than energy. So, at any sort of temperature, the rotation in the graphene will be very low energy, while on the boron nitride, half an EV is a significant barrier to overcoming rotation. So, Using the data that is done in my group, so this is essentially the, this, uh, I'm sorry for switching between energy units, because 12.4 k cal is roughly half EV, so that's the half EV from the previous slide. We managed to train our force field against that. We didn't get everything right, but we generally managed to get that orientation bias pretty well reproduced. And so now we can actually do a lot of the scale simulation, see during the growth whether that orientation bias is maintained. So this is pretty much our simulation. Once again, this is going to be forced by Monte Carlo. We try to do this at lower temperature as we can. The chart in the Carlo is pushing our resources a little bit, but we don't want to go too high in temperature because everything goes far more uh, 3D-like. Uh, now, one thing, so I just want to, uh, before you ask me, clearly our amount of molybdenum broken is way too high. Uh, this is just a sort of, a, you know, getting a sort of a feel for the system. So we put a lot of molybdenum there just to get our statistics better. We will see in the animation you see in a second that this is a really bad idea to do, because all your growth nuclei are directly going to communicate with each other and you get, you get a sense of very, uh, you can get no crystallinity out of it. But you can at least use this to statistically sample initial growth and see whether that essentially fits with that DFT picture. So here's a, this is a pretty long movie, so get yourself a comfy chair and uh, see what goes, but we, uh, so the blue atoms are the molybdenum, uh, the yellow atoms are the sulfur, and we can essentially already begin to see some pretty nice growth nuclei. And the main thing is you remember that graphene movie, and the graphene movie you saw that fragments were sliding all over the graphene surface and doing all sort of exciting rotations. These things are essentially rotation linear. So the, uh, at the moment that you make an initial nucleus, but the, the rotational bias is there. Now, later on, on the simulation, clearly we get contact between the various growth nuclei, so that's something that we uh, kind of, uh, that is, doesn't have a real good experimental equivalent. But this at least gives us the confidence to say, okay, this is worth doing a much larger scale simulation, not where we lower the initial molybdenum sites and essentially look indeed and at some details what the initial steps and how essentially the orientation bias is maintained in the simulation. So this is kind of what we are trying to get from there, and this is uh, early days for this, so this is uh, early stage analysis. But we essentially can grow our initial type of crystallite, and we essentially can then see how that's uh, transformed into, into full islands, of, uh, or, and how essentially during that process, if there's rotation in place, uh, and then uh, compare that with exponential observables. So this is all with relatively simple growth sources. So we just add every now and then a molybdenum atom and a silver atom in the box. And that's kind of nice, but it doesn't really show, uh, it's, it's not the same as a real CVD growth. So on, the, uh, on a different uh, simulation uh, uh, project in my group, in collaboration with UNG uh, and uh, with Rogaya and Dunda again, we've been looking at more complex chemistry. In this case, we look at uh, 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 tungsten uh, hexacarbonyl with uh, hydrogen selenide. And it's a difficult to, to see this movie, but you can essentially see indeed that I can uh, dissociate my carbon monoxide and functionalize it with selenium, so that kind of works. What is probably more interesting here is that we managed to connect the, the reaction kinetic that we got from VXLF with essentially see the computational fluid dynamics methods from uh, Johan Jans group. So this is attractive because these uh, CFD simulations can directly do simulations at experimental time and size scales. And what I can get out of that is these type of pictures. Imagine this, this dark blue thing is your growth stage. So the CFD simulation can tell you, okay, what type of species are, do I get in my growth stage? And how can I make my CFD growth reproducible? If I, for example, change something in my alignment of my growth chamber, I can now maybe do a CFD simulation saying, okay, how do I treat my chemistry? to get something get the same chemistry profile so I can hopefully reproduce my growth. So just to show you some highlights of that, so this is, for example, we can, as a function of time, we can so we see that, for example, the tungsten hexacarbonyl doesn't survive very long. It essentially dissociates very early in the chamber. Uh, 
Uh, and we can see all the various intermediates of growth. So we see that this, uh, the diselenium has a significant amount of concentration, especially to the back end of the growth stage. Um, and so we can see this is probably the main growth speed, at least fundamentally, this is the best species that you can get in the, uh, in the gas environment, if you, uh, if you uh, limit yourself to a single tungsten. And we can predict their patterns. Also, uh, so this is good for experiment because we can essentially get those patterns and see how that reproduces experiments. But also, from a simulation perspective, this is really, this is really great feedback into the reaction loop. So now, in the next stage, when we do the reaction loop, well, with not just molecular and solar atoms, we actually use proper molecular species, we can go, okay, what type of molecular species distribution do we have to put in our simulation box? And there's other things. It is really easy, well, and I shouldn't say that, it is relatively straightforward to do uncertainty quantification at a CV level. So I can take my barriers as they come out of the reactor level or the DFT, I can change them and say, okay, which ones are the real important ones? And that can go back. So DFT, as I mentioned earlier, has its own error bars. It's not, uh, and, but we can, in principle, do better than DFT. There are also a couple cluster methods and all that. If, if we find out this bear is really key, we need to get it to identical accuracy, and DFT typically, its accuracy is not what we would call identical accuracy, we can go beyond DFT and essentially get the start of data. If you say, for example, that the H2 formation step is something that's critical for the species distribution, we can get that sort of feedback out of the CD. So this is kind of the idea. So this is where we uh, are looking to work on in the next year or so. Uh, we now have a good gas phase composition. Well, we can get these profiles. We can now go, uh, instead of using molecular and sulfur atoms, we can put these species into our molecular uh, reactive hyperdynamic simulation. Look at crystal seeds. We can then link that to morphology recognition. So that's uh, Susan Simmons' group has significant uh, experience in that. And then with maybe machine learning type sort of we can pick out long-term behavior. If you see a growth seed and we kind of know what it's going to look like a little bit later, we can maybe make some sort of faster time step to go to our bigger seeds. And so from, from two ends, we can send the growth experiment. So this CFD directly can uh, connect with experimental settings. So we can see, okay, how do I reproduce my growth patterns if I want to realign my, uh, my growth chamber? But also, by, uh, by this means, we can actually look at uh, connect up time scales and size scales as between, from optimistic scale simulation to essentially experimental uh, uh, sizes and times. So that's the end of it. Uh, just a very general summary slide. So this is a hugely transferable concept. So don't feel that, okay, I, I mentioned a couple of materials. This is certainly not a restriction that we have. We can develop properly. There's a couple of materials that are blacked out here. This is not because reactor air doesn't work, it's simply because we didn't have a project for them. So we are going to venture into uh, Gallium, that actually that project has started already. And so we can develop these for a wide range of materials. Um, and it essentially allows you to uh, significantly scale up from the quantum, so it actually can begin to get uh, to experimental size and time ranges. So thank you very much, and I'll be very happy to discuss this further with you. Any questions in the room while they're typing online? <coughs> so for, for the um, simulation, when you have orientation of the tungsten sel selenide, sorry, but, well, tungsten yeah. yeah. Um So was it the um, MD or, or Monte Carlo? So do you know what, what time it took to do that stuff? Or, or well, was, that's, 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 that's essentially one of the issues with force bias in Monte Carlo, that the time bias is gone. So, I think there's a, especially simply very interested in just the initial stages as well, not necessarily the crystalline. It clearly pays off to do simply a macronomics run on this thing. Uh, we, we can do still the false bias to say, yes, this will eventually form something that looks like a crystal, but simply interested in the really, the very early stages, it would be good to put a sort of a time concept on that, and that's, uh, we typically look now, this was first bias Monte Carlo, we can get a time uh, concept if there's only a single chemistry event that accel gets accelerated by Monte Carlo. Unfortunately, this is such a complex growth mechanism that I don't think we can make that claim. So we have to be step back to molecular dynamics to actually get a time uh, 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 stamp out of that. Yeah. So we have a question online. Oh, okay. Is it possible to functionalize aluminum disulfide monolayer membranes with ethanol using REACTS FF? Yes. So that's not that dissimilar to what we shown here. We already shown the epoxide. Clearly, we picked epoxide because the barriers are really low. Epoxide is essentially a spring-loaded molecule. 
So even on our time scale, you can add more. As soon as it sniffs a vacancy, it will pretty much open up. After all, the chemistry is a little bit more complex because it's a more stable molecule. So the question is how you sample whatever barriers are for that, but we can certainly train reacts there for that. And then you may have to pick some sort of accelerated dynamics tool to actually capture the chemistry. But the short answer is yes. There's no more questions online. Any more questions in the room to wrap up? I'll ask, I'll ask one question. Um, so uh, you were showing that there's interlocking with the HBN, so that they, there's sort of no rotation. Yeah. Those are with defects in the HBN. Did you do the defects in the graphene as well? And you we did not. This random no, that, that's a good point. No, we didn't. I don't expect we'll see that, but we have to do that. Because yeah. we, we have a lot of experimental evidence that there is okay. commensurability between the TMDs and the graphene. Okay. Um, yeah, it's either you know zero or sixty degrees okay. in terms of the orientation yeah. versus most of them being at zero. Let's say. No. Now that we should certainly do the graphene defect as well. The one issue that we have there, well, we, we, can, we can solve that. So far, we can't ignore molecular carbon interaction or anything that we did because we felt okay, if the solver that did the interaction clearly for that sort of simulation, you'll have to. Worry about the molecular carbon side of things as well, but yeah, we, we, we can do that. Yeah. One more question for the different part of the uh, in, in the earlier chemical reactions when you explained that. So since you include chrome interactions, so you, you should probably be able to do these reactions in a strong electric field. Yes, that's true. And I have to bear in mind that elect as long as the electric field is essentially a charge field that doesn't uh, essentially change the chemistry. So if it if you talk about something that actually transfers electrons in the medium and you actually do something, that is something that we don't react to that because we don't have that explicit. But if it just essentially needs a charge field that orientates molecules and maybe lower barriers, yes, and we've done that. Uh, there's, for example, some papers that were done uh, a little while ago that we saw that in the electric field, we can, for example, oxidize nickel very 